because of scheduling conflicts, I wasn't able to post my review of the third Fear Street film as soon as I wanted. But better late than never, I guess. Here's what I thought of Lou Janiak's third and final installment of the three-part movie trilogy, Fear Street. Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights. I'm M.L. Miller. Before we begin, please do me a favor and punch that like button down below. Share this video with all of your social media addicted pals. Click subscribe to this channel and ring that bell for notifications. Fear Street Part 3, 1666, is new streaming on Netflix. It's directed by Lee Janiak, written by Phil Graziati, Lee Janiak, Kate Treffrey, from the book series by R.L. Stein. At the end of our last Fear Street, our hero Dina, played by Kiana Madiera, and her brother Josh, played by Benjamin Flores Jr., found the missing hand of Sarah Fear played by Elizabeth Scopel, who was hung as a witch and cursed the town of Shadyside to be the homicide capital of the country. In order to save the life of her possessed girlfriend Sam, played by Olivia Scott Welch, Dina attempts to reunite the missing hand with the rest of Fear's body, but all this does is transfer Dina's consciousness back in time to Sarah Fear's body in 1666, and Dina experiences firsthand the days leading up to Sarah's death. Fear Street, Part 3, 1666, not only gives us the whole story of Sarah Fear, but also shuffles back to 1994 as Dina, Ziggy, played by Jillian Jacobs, and Josh attempt to end the curse once and for all and take on the evil behind the curse from the very beginning. High stakes are at play in this final chapter, and while I think Lee Janiak does a decent job of handling the multiple time periods, multiple characters, and multiple motivations, that doesn't stop the third chapter of Fear Street from becoming quite convoluted by the end. All of the rules are established in the previous entries. The possessed murderers are after the blood of the cursed one, whomever that happens to be, and ignores everyone else in their path. Because of this, the kids hatch an elaborate plan inside the mall in order to trap the murderers and defeat the evil. Still, because these little details were not treated as so important in the films prior, which instead seemed to focus on the lesbian teenage angst and drama as the driving force of the films. Somewhere along the way, the important stuff that glues everything together felt as if it loosened a bit making the final moments of this film feel rather messy, rushed, and the evil easily defeated. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we go back to the future of 1994, the third film takes us back to 1666, where we experience Sarah Fear's plight firsthand. I thought Janiac did a decent job of distancing herself from using music as a crutch to communicate mood and emotion as she did in the first two installments. In 1666, she relied more on the performances and revisiting a lot of the drama that occurred in the previous films. In 1994, Dina and Sam are star-crossed lovers. Their relationship is frowned upon by their parents and the community. That's pretty much the same way the two of them are represented in 1666 as well. Sure, in Part 3, we see the beginning of Sam and Dina's relationship forming, while in 1994, we're made privy to what looks to be their breakup and eventual reunion, but for the most part, much of the same themes are applied. Because Dina is transferred into the body of Sarah, who we know is accused to be a witch, it's pretty much apparent how the first section of this story is going to play out. We were told what happened, not once, but twice in the previous two films so seeing it played out isn't as relevatory or powerful as I think the filmmakers wanted it to be. It just makes the whole thing feel sort of like a waste of time, something that could have been flashed back to for a short period of time, and then the story could continue going forward. Instead, we got a whole movie about it. Pacing and runtime is an issue in all three of the Fear Street movies. None of them need to be two hours long, but for some reason, each seems to stretch as far as it can to reach that almost 120-minute length. I don't know if six hours is the secret of the Netflix algorithm or what, but it definitely makes for an overwrought series of films. A half hour and some could have been nixed from each film, 
and it would have been a much smoother and more manageable series to digest. I also don't understand why, if the third film was going to use most of the main cast from the first film, they didn't just recast the entire second film the same way with the same actors. I understand then we wouldn't get more teenage actors to star in the film, but I think it would have made for a more consistent storyline had the cast from part one showed up in part two as well, sort of like the way characters are recast in the American Horror Story series. By the time part three came around, the actors were vaguely familiar as key roles from the previous two, but aside from the main characters, a lot of them didn't stand out, and combining the cast of the first two movies just makes for more convolution visually. At least, that's how I perceived it. I didn't hate the third film. The church scene was pretty gnarly and well-paced, with some great suspenseful and shocking moments, though I think there would have been a bigger pile of eyes there in the middle of the church, given the amount of them plucked from the victims. While I think the spread of rumor and paranoia involving the witch trials has been communicated better in films like The Witch, Janiac does a convincing job of showing how a town plagued by poverty, despair, ignorance, and blind faith can be easily and quickly manipulated into becoming a monstrous mass of fanatics. I do feel the whole thing was wrapped up tidier than my particular tastes. Sure, you want to have the heroes smiling and happy by the end, but this one ends in an overly saccharinated way. The reveal of who is behind the whole mess is somewhat predictable, especially since there really isn't a lot of people left to choose from who are not possessed or dead yet by the time this third film comes around. As a whole, I found this Fear Street trilogy to be overlong and a little telling of Janiac's stylings. She does a great job developing likable characters. She doesn't shy away from the horror or the controversial stuff like suicide, drugs, and teenage sex. I still think each film, on its own, is a breezy but entertaining watch. Each has an edge to them that you don't often see in modern mainstream horror films. Out of all of the films, I think 1994 is the best of the bunch. I really feel that's where all of the interesting ideas and big moments lie. The rest of the films seem to just riff on what was established in the first film. Despite the fact that I feel it peaked too early, I definitely would recommend the Fear Street series to those who enjoy mainstream horror, but still want to be surprised and creeped out a bit. I think the third film is definitely burdened by having to wrap up all of those loose ends and is least able to stand on its own. 1978 was fun, but really doesn't add much to the subgenre it's lauding. But if you just want to experience the distilled best parts of the series, the first film, 1994, is the one that deserves the most accolades. It shows Janiac really has what it takes as a new filmmaker to highlight bold, bright, and terrifying new horrors. I can't wait to see what Janiac is doing next, be it another season of Fear Street or another amazing film like her first film, Honeymoon. I'll be there no matter what. What do you guys think of Fear Street now that you've seen all three? Which was your favorite of the series? Let me know down in the comments. That'll be it for today. Please chime in down below in the comments and let me know how on the nose or mind-numbingly wrong I am, or you can counter with your own review. So guys, you know how YouTube works. I'd love to be able to dedicate more time to this channel. I'm not monetized yet, so if you want to help me out, remember to hit all the pertinent bells and whistles down below. Want some spooky comics to read? I have two new horror comic book trade paperbacks you should look out for. Both Grave Trancers and Pirouette, collecting never-before-published issues, can be found in only the finest of comic book shops. If you're looking for written reviews, you can find them on my website, mlmillerwrites.com. If you really want to show your support, I also have a Patreon page, at mlmiller. Look for the link to my Patreon page down below. Thank you so much for your time, and take care. Stuck inside your reality You're doomed Oh, you're doomed You're Yeah.